Hey, well, hello, my name is Jeff Smith, and I am the Strategic Partnership and Outreach Specialist for the Institute of Cannabis Research, hosted at Colorado State University, Pueblo. Welcome to the Cannabis Research Webinar Series, which is presented by the ICR and the Lambert Center for the Study of Medicinal Cannabis and Hemp at Thomas Jefferson University. This webinar series in collaboration with the Lambert Center is one of the many ways that the ICR works to promote the dissemination of cannabis research. For example, please see our website, which can be found by Googling the words Institute of Cannabis Research. And from there, you can navigate to the outreach tab and find the current e-newsletter. Also, you can navigate to the research tab in our website and view summaries of each of the research projects that the ICR currently funds. We currently fund 20 research projects around the state of Colorado. You can also find information about future monthly webinars on the website. We are happy to announce that we anticipate launching a new website in the very near future, and so please stay tuned. You can use our current website now to sign up for our list serve to get updates about that and other activities at the Institute of Cannabis Research. Additionally, please note the link on our website to the Journal of Cannabis Research, which the ICR sponsors. The journal is published by prestigious Spring of Nature and is always looking for both high quality scientific article submissions and reviewers. Additional information about the ICR is also available on our website, so please visit us. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to mention some logistical items for the webinar. Today's presentation will be followed by a short question and answer period. To ask a question, please do so using the Q&A feature in the Zoom toolbar. You can enter questions at any time during the presentations. We will address as many questions as time allows at the end of the hour. Please reserve the chat function in Zoom for technical issues and questions. Both the Q&A and chat functions can be found on the toolbar of your Zoom screen. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ruth Charbonneau, the Associate Director of the Lambert Center, who will be introducing today's presenter and moderating the webinar. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we're pleased today to have Dr. Tess Edom, who earned her PhD in microbiology, discovering novel antimicrobial compounds against bacterial pathogens. And she has continued to expand her knowledge in and outside of the laboratory, building a strong background in manufacturing, product safety and quality, and microbial detection and prevention measures with a focus on controlled environment agricultural settings. Dr. Edom is a senior research at the University of Colorado Boulder in the Aerobiology and Disinfection Laboratory investigating air molds, allergens, and pathogens, where the, she works to uncover new methods to kill and deactivate microorganisms and their high, harmful bioactive agents. She is the chief scientist at her company, Rogue Micro Microbial uh, Micro LLC, and she consults with CEA manufacturers, regulators, and laboratories in the cannabis space to understand and overcome microbial challenges. Uh, please join us here today uh, in addressing and accessing microbial, uh, micro microbial risks to can cannabis patients and consumers. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Edom. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm really excited to be here today. I uh, really admire the Institute of Cannabis Research and all the work that you're doing here in Colorado, where I am. So um, as Ruth said, I am a microbiologist. I uh, studied Staphylococcus aureus, and the last four years or so, I've been working in the cannabis space. Um, where I got my start in manufacturing and um, have moved into more of a quality consulting role. And I also work as a senior researcher in the aerobiology and disinfection lab at CU Boulder, and we study bioaerosols and allergens. And today we're going to be talking about the microbial risk to cannabis patients and consumers with a focus on cannabis flower products. So how do we assess those risks and how do we address them as manufacturers, consumers, and regulators? 
So um, just to get started, sure. Uh, let's take a step back and think about how far the cannabis industry has really come, especially over the last 10 years. Um, in most states now, you'll see that a medical or recreational program has been legalized, um, where usually medical markets open up first. So there are a lot of medical benefits to cannabis that are pretty well established now, um, where it can be helpful for different therapies. And after a medical market opens up in a state, usually a recreational market uh, opens up pretty shortly after. And um, a lot of that has to do with not only the medicinal benefits of cannabis, but also uh, because it generates a lot of revenue, job growth, things like that. And in 2022 alone, nearly $3 billion in retail uh, taxes were collected. So what I wanna really emphasize in this is even though you know, cannabis is growing and it's, uh, it's becoming more and more common, it really did start in, as a medical purpose. Um, and people are really starting to perceive it as pretty safe. So cannabis is really perceived as more of a safe uh, product than a lot of other kind of uh, similar combusted products like tobacco. You can see, I've, I've just taken some screenshots here, the Centers for Disease Control, American Cancer Society, they have entire sections of their website that are dedicated to um, the use of cannabis or marijuana um, in cancer treatments to really mitigate some of the nausea and things like that that can happen um, during cancer chemotherapy. And um, not only are these institutions um, kind of opening up a little bit more to the use of cannabis, but we're seeing a lot of people that you wouldn't necessarily expect starting to use cannabis more often. So these two articles are pretty recent. They just came out within the last few months showing that senior citizens are the fastest growing uh, cannabis clientele. And, um, and there's this recent paper that just came out talking about the perceptions of safety of daily cannabis versus tobacco smoking and secondhand smoke exposure. And again, this paper is really recent, just came out a few months ago. And the results of this paper were really interesting. I encourage you to go and read it. But basically, uh, most folks who were surveyed really uh, view cannabis as much different than tobacco. It's safer. It's safer for pregnant women. It's safer for secondhand exposure to children than tobacco. Um, and what's really interesting, and I just wanted to take another screenshot of the conclusions and relevance that was uh, actually in print on this study, where it said, yeah, the study found that U.S. adults are increasingly perceived that daily smoking and secondhand exposure to cannabis is safer than tobacco. But you can see I highlighted here, given that these views do not reflect the existing science on cannabis and tobacco smoke, the findings may have important implications for public health and policy. So this is kind of a scientist's way of saying, yeah, you think it's safer, but you're wrong. And um, a lot of that is based on just very preliminary evidence. So we have more um, of an understanding of tobacco than we do with cannabis, but the, the literature is growing with cannabis um, to understand those risks. And it's, it's growing more and more every day, thanks to researchers like those here at ICR. Um, but there's still a lot that's not known, especially when we think about the fact that these were medical programs to begin with. We have a lot of vulnerable populations who are using cannabis. Um, the most common way that people typically use cannabis is through smoking or vaporization of flour. And we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. So, um, you know, there's there's this big deal that cannabis is still federally illegal, even though that map I showed you of all the states that have legalized in one way or another, it's still federally illegal. It's a schedule one drug, which to get into that category, you have to be considered no having no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So cannabis is right up there with heroin, LSD and MDMA. Because of this, the federal government won't touch cannabis. So there's no federal oversight. There's no USDA regulation like with other crops. There's no FDA regulation like with other um, products that are consumed. Um, there's really just piecemeal state regulations that cover the, the different aspects of manufacturing and con consumer safety and things like that. 
There's also no good practices that are enforced in the U.S. So good agricultural practices or GAP, good manufacturing practices, even health inspections that restaurants in each state have to undergo typically are not enforced in each state. So even when you're consuming cannabis edibles, they do not have to adhere to good manufacturing practices for human food or follow the Food Safety Modernization Act or FSMA. And so these are issues not only with cannabis uh, smoking, but also with other uh, types of consumed products that contain cannabinoids. And on top of all of that, it is very challenging to research uh, the risks that are associated with cannabis consumption um, for scientists and medical professionals. So most folks don't want to admit that they smoke or consume a Schedule One drug. And so that can skew a lot of the medical professional uh, data that's out there. And as a scientist, you know, it's, it can be very frustrating to try to study this because uh, like in Colorado, where I'm from right now, um, we, you can go down the street and pick up cannabis from one of a dozen different dispensaries right across the street from, you know, CU Boulder. But as a researcher, I can't go get cannabis from that dispensary and bring it back and study it. I have to get a DEA license and then I can only get cannabis from a handful of DEA growers. So these it's, it makes it very challenging to actually study the products that consumers are consuming. And when I talk to you know cannabis growers um, and other folks in manufacturing, a lot of them will have anecdotal stories about how, well, I've been smoking for 20 years and I've never had an issue. I've never heard of anyone getting sick. Um, but there's no national repository for these adverse reactions to cannabis. And I like to, you know, really uh, kind of reiterate the quote, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because we don't have a lot of evidence surrounding the risks when it comes to cannabis consumption, specifically those microbial risks that we're going to talk about today, that does not mean that they don't exist. And so, you know, what can we um, really pull from other industries as far as, you know, uh, these inhalation-based risks? What, what do we know from, you know, indoor air quality or occupational health and safety or air pollution that's regulated by EPA? Um, what can we pull from those parallel industries to kind of understand a little bit better um, that uh, about the risks? So how do we assess and address those risks? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So this is just a big summary slide of what I'm going to cover. We're going to review those cannabis flower inhalation risks. This is, again, really focusing in on flower products, although, like I mentioned, there could be other risks. Uh, when you're talking about not following good practices, especially for, you know, edibles production and things like that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the entire sort of approach by cannabis uh, in each state really focuses on this quality by testing scheme instead of a quality by design approach. And then we're going to cover some recommendations from parallel industries like food manufacturing, and health agencies and professional organizations. So we can look to those recommendations to start making positive changes in the cannabis space. So from these indoor air quality, uh, pollution, occupational safety, and even uh, you know, food safety, typically when you're doing a risk assessment or a hazard analysis, you bin those risks into these three categories, your chemical risks, physical risks, and biological risks. And when you're looking at chemicals or thinking about chemicals in cannabis, a lot of times folks think about, you know, heavy metals since cannabis is a bioaccumulator, or they think about pesticides, and those can all definitely be risks to consumers. But there's also risks that are produced during combustion. And this paper was actually really cool. It's also a recent one that came out comparing uh, the chemical components of tobacco and cannabis and which components they have in common. And they share dozens of different chemicals that are known carcinogens, mutagens, stratagens, and other toxic chemicals in cannabis and tobacco smoke. Some of these include formaldehyde um, and other really no, well-known uh, you know, toxic chemicals to inhale. When we think about physical risks, 
you know, this is, this is a, I love this um, figure. It's on the EPA. Every time we talk about particulate matter, this one comes up, but it's showing a zoom in, in image on a strand of hair and how particulate matter, how small it is. So you can see like PM10 or particulate matter that's 10 microns or smaller can fit around, you know, human hair, probably like 10 times. And within one of those PM10s, you can see even smaller particulate matter, 2.5 microns and smaller, can fit across one of those PM10s. And, and these particulate matter um, uh, particles can be really harmful both in the airways, um, where PM10 tends to be, you know, to collect in your trachea and your, and, uh, you know, the branches within your lung, but also PM2.5 can be particularly harmful because it can actually penetrate deep down into your lungs and go into the alveoli of your lungs where air exchange happens. And we'll have a cool figure about that here later. And, you know, these physical risks, when you think about them, they're, they're irritants, they can agitate, they can cause physical harm, um, but they can also allow some of these chemicals and biological risks to kind of piggyback on this particulate matter, which really exacerbates um, some of these risks. And biological risks, these are living microorganisms and their bioactive agents, which we know can cause harm when you breathe them in. For today's talk, we're gonna really zoom in on these biological risks, but none of these risks really exist independently. They all interact with each other and can actually negatively uh, impact uh, each other uh, exponentially. So for example, if you, if you just have one biological risk that you're breathing in, that can cause some harm. But if you add in different chemical risks, you get more than an additive effect. You get a synergistic effect in many different instances that we have seen over and over again with, with inhalation risks. So really focusing in on these biological risks, we can kind of bend them into two categories. Um, when it comes to biological risk to cannabis consumers, again, focusing on flower smoking and vaporization. So the acute risks are really those that are caused by living or viable microorganisms that are also human pathogens. And these microbes can survive combustion and vaporization and become airborne in smoke and be breathed into the lungs. And I'll show you on the next slide some more uh, evidence of that. And then we also have these chronic risks. So these are more long-term exposure to microbial toxins, allergens, other bioactive agents. These do not necessarily require those microorganisms to be living. Um, and it actually can just be caused by the bits and pieces of those microbes as well. So their metabolites and their breakdown products over time. And so that's how we're really going to look at biological risks to cannabis smokers and vaporizers. And first we're gonna look at those pathogens. So we've known, I, I have to put this long list of, um, of references here because a lot of folks will, uh, in the, especially in the cannabis space, just don't really believe that, you, that there can be risks associated with smoking cannabis. Um, and, and I get it because it's been very therapeutic to many people but um, I, I really want to illustrate that there are case studies here showing that not only can microbes survive combustion and vaporization, we've known that uh, microbes can survive combustion since the 1960s when some of these preliminary studies were done with cigarette smoke. And we know microbes can survive vaporization. The FDA did a study last year showing that cannabis in a vaporizer inoculated with different microbes, specifically E. coli, those microbes don't die after vaporization. Um, they actually, it doesn't really do much at all to kill any microbes. It just aerosolizes them so that you can breathe them in. Um, there's a lot of really cool experiments that are being done by researchers a little bit more in tobacco than in cannabis, where they're trying to understand how these microbes, you know, carry over into smoke, which ones can survive, what kinds of microbes by sequencing are, are in that smoke and which ones grow. Um, and when you look at case studies, which again, this is another hurdle that medical professionals have to overcome, uh, you can see that there are uh, associations between smoking cannabis and different um, infections by these opportunistic pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
Cryptococcus neoformans, which is, uh, these are all fungal. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a bacterial pathogen. Cryptococcus neoformans, Rhizopus and Aspergillus are all fungal pathogens, mostly opportunistic. And these infections are associated with cannabis use, again, with, uh, you know, many different citations here. And again, because we don't have a real good view, uh, sometimes scientists and other medical professionals kind of have to go back and try to figure out what the risks actually are by going and looking at insurance claims, which is what um, this paper showed, where uh, cannabis users were three and a half times more likely to have fungal infections than non-users, and about half of those infections were attributed to aspergillosis. So you can see that this is a, uh, an x-ray cross-section of um, infected patients' lungs, and there are aspergill aspergillosis, um, you know, dense areas of infection, and then there's even emphysema areas, which I'll talk about here on the next slide. So there is a correlation between some of these um, microbes that we uh, can find on cannabis. We know that microbes can survive during combustion and vaporization. And uh, cannabis users do have a higher incident of infections, especially fungal infections of the lung. So these living acute risks can pose a, a hazard to users, but also so can these more chronic biological uh, exposure to biological agents. So hundreds of uh, fungal toxins have been identified. These are phylogenetic trees with a different color kind of binning together related organisms who uh, produce very similar fungal toxins. You know, there's hundreds of toxins that have been identified, but only a handful of toxins are actually tested for in cannabis. So there's a big blind spot there. Um, there's other biological agents like endotoxin or LPS, exotoxins or gosterol, which is part of fungal cell membranes, peptidoglycan and other components of microbes that can elicit immune responses. And you can see here on the left, this is um, a diagram of epi airway epithelial cells being exposed to different endotoxin and allergen levels and how that can basically create this cascade of immune responses with different chemokines, cytokines, and recruitment of immune cells to ultimately um, result in some negative health consequences like asthma, COPD, and even lung cancer. And again, a lot of this data is uh, really understood through parallel uh, investigations with occupational safety, you know, agricultural dust, and um, other exposures that you see in indoor air quality um, research and, um, you know, other airway and inhalation risk research that's out there. Similar results are found with programmed cell death when cells are exposed to this fungal membrane uh, component called ergosterol, where it induces pyroptosis and it has this impact on the immune system. So these agents can act, you know, pretty independently of some of those other components of smoke to elicit these negative health consequences. In addition, we also should be thinking about microbial allergens. This is something that I study in the aerobiology and disinfection lab with Dr. Mark Hernandez. And you know, th this, this is picturing uh, different aspergillus species or aspergillus fumigatus, I should, I should say, and some of their allergens. And these allergens are also something that we should really consider in food. You have to consider foodborne allergens and many folks are very sensitized to mold allergens and other types of aeroallergens. And these allergens can induce asthma attacks and can really uh, cause a lot of problems. And about 10 people die every day from an asthma attack in the United States. So there are uh, real risks associated with these microbial bits and pieces that do not require the microbes to be alive, to be harmful, and we can see that in some of the research around these biological agents. So looking at tobacco and cannabis users and research that's done on these components, we know that biological agents um, like LPS and ergosterol can be found in tobacco smoke. And the, the presence of these uh, components, these biological agents, is associated with, with COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, bronchitis, and alveolar hypersensitivity. So on the right here, you can see 
a healthy lung and the branches or the bronchioles of those lung, of the lung tissue and a healthy alveoli, or these are the sacs where air exchange occurs. When a patient has emphysema, those alveoli are collapsed. And when a patient has bronchitis, basically the bronchioles get plugged up with mucus. And so it's very difficult for these folks to breathe. Um, and they have a lot of challenges, um, you know, carrying out normal everyday functions. And when you look at smoking cannabis and the risks associated with that, you see that cannabis smokers have more outpatient medical visits for respiratory issues. They have higher rates of pulmonary diseases, including chronic bronchitis and emphysema, which again are both types of COPD. So these are the risks that we know are associated with those bits and pieces of microbes, as well as the acute risks of living microorganisms and infection. And from a cannabis compliance point of view, you know, we know that um, that microbes are a risk, and that's why many states, not all, but many states do test for specific microbes um, or other micro-related risks. So here's a, an image that's meant to be very busy because every state's a little bit different, um, but it's really outlining the different cannabis compliance tests that are required in each step in each state. Not every state requires all of these tests. Um, but most states will require a, a good chunk of these tests. And when you look at them, a large proportion of them are related to the microbial risks associated with cannabis, um, with some caveats that, you know, if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. So, for example, yes, there are a handful of mycotoxins that are tested for in cannabis, mostly those produced by Aspergillus species. But not, uh, it does not account for other types of toxins. Like I said, there's hundreds of different mycotoxins out there. Um, Fusarium, for example, produces dozens of toxin, mycotoxins, and it's a common um, plant pathogen that's found on cannabis, but we don't test for any of those fusarium toxins. Um, there's microbial screening that's performed by qPCR. This is a DNA-based method looking for specific microbes, typically it's you know, gonna be E. coli, salmonella, and then the four aspergillus species of concern. But as I mentioned in my acute risk slide, there are other um, microorganisms associated with cannabis use that are not tested for, and so we don't see those. Then we also look at microbial counts. So this is a colony forming unit count per gram. And depending on the selective media that you use, this is usually gonna be uh, total aerobic bacteria count or TAC, total yeast and mold count, TYM. Sometimes states will test for coliforms or Enterobacteraceae. Um, but this is, again, some count that the state kind of somewhat arbitrarily sets a limit. And if you pass that limit, then you will fail. So here in Colorado, the limit for total yeast and mold is 10,000 CFU per gram. In Michigan, uh, the rec rec side of Michigan is 100,000 CFU per gram. So it really depends on the state and um, what they're actually testing for. And then moisture content and water activity are also kind of roundabout ways to uh, test for microbial regrowth, making sure that no microbes, um, you know, the water content in that flower product specifically isn't high enough that those microbes can come back after dry cure. And so it's, you know, pretty clear that cannabis testing understands the risks of, uh, you know, these microbial hazards, but the way that cannabis testing is really performed follows this scheme, this quality by testing scheme, which really doesn't take any risk prevention measures. So to kind of go through what that really means, a cannabis cultivator We'll go through the cultivation process, you know, all the way from moms to dry cure to trim and final pack with processing and manufacturing. So if they're going to grind and make pre-rolls, then they will do that or they'll sell as bulk trimmed flour. Um, and then after they're done through this cultivation and processing and manufacturing steps, they'll submit to a third party compliance testing lab. Um, to see if their cannabis product passes and for flour, you know, early on in, in the very early days of cannabis um, legalization, people would fail for pesticides and heavy metals, but a lot of that has 
um, since kind of gone, you know, by the wayside because people are using better substrates. They're not spraying, you know, Eagle 20 and my Michael But Butinol on products anymore, which is good, but um, there's still other pesticides that are sprayed for and not tested for. Um, but nowadays, when most people fail cannabis flower products, they're failing for microbial contamination. So if they if they don't fail, if their flower passes, then they can sell that product to consumers. If they do fail, you know, if they if they don't pass the state testing requirements, then cannabis cultivators are really in a little bit of a bind because there's not, you know, as with other crops, there isn't crop insurance. There's really no way to recover that loss. And so that's what they try to do. They try to recover every gram of that product. And usually they're going to go through a remediation route. So remediation will use high levels of ozone or high levels of radiation. Here in the U.S., x-ray radiation is very common. Um, in other countries, usually it's gamma. Um, or they'll use radio frequency. Sometimes people will just have a big UV light set up in their dry cure room and just, you know, UV the crap out of their flower until it passes. So essentially they will recover that adulterated product, that non-compliant product, resubmit it for third-party testing. And in many states, there are not really regulations on how many times you can do this. So you can kind of go through this remediation process over and over again until it passes and then you can sell it to consumers and you don't have to tell consumers in many states that you remediated a failed product. And so especially again for these vulnerable populations, which are now making up a pretty large portion of cannabis consumers in the United States, um, this could be a, a risk to those consumers that this remediated product has been recovered. Um, some growers will extract that into oil and very, very few people will actually destroy that product again, because margins are so tight. And when it comes to manufacturing and reporting, there are very few requirements to really address the underlying causes for why you failed in the first place. Um, most of the manufacturing and reporting requirements really center around diversion and security, making sure that none of this product is going out the back door and into the black or gray market. And so that's really how these quality by testing schemes work, um, where the cultivator is kind of blind to their micro issues until they submit for third party testing, and then they can recover through that process of remediation. Now, if you look at parallel industries like food manufacturing, they take a much different approach. They take a quality by design approach where they first build a product safety plan before they even make their product they have to do a hazard analysis, proactively address any biological, chemical, or physical risks that can be introduced during their process from their supply chain or from their environment. And they have to put in controls that they monitor. They have corrective actions if those controls are not, uh, if they don't work. They have validation protocols and data. So they have to generate a lot of data around um, the fact if these controls work or not. And then every time they go through that step, they have to verify that those controls are working as intended to control that hazard, in this case, a biological hazard. And within that safety product plan, you know, there's a lot of overlap between these different controls that you have to put in place. So I'm a PCQI, a preventive controls qualified individual. I can help people go through this and identify those hazards and implement some preventive control so that you are addressing those issues before they even become a problem and you're monitoring them as you go. And all of this sits squarely in your GMPs, your good manufacturing practices and other prerequisite programs. So good sanitation program, good glove use, hand washing, you know, what to do when employees are sick. Um, all of that really is built around this product safety plan. And that is something that is just not um, really done in cannabis. It's again, following this quality by testing scheme. So there's really no need in cannabis right now to really address the underlying uh, root causes of why they're failing for microbial contaminants. Um, and that's really unfortunate because there is more and more data that's coming out 
about those underlying root causes of contamination. And there's this paper that came out by Zamir Kunja up in Canada. He research, he's a plant pathologist. And uh, this paper really goes through all of the different contributors to high total yeast and mold or TYM counts on cannabis product. And it identifies the common denominators of these uh, contaminants. And so, you know, uh, leaving dead plant matter sitting around in your garden and not going through and culling diseased plants, having contaminated water, your growing substrate can also be contaminated. Um, airborne contaminants, especially molds, they like to float around in the air and spread that way. Um, if you are, if you have diseased plants, what are you doing as part of your IPM or integrated pest management program? to really cull those plants and get them out of your garden before they cause uh, problems in a neighboring batch or in a batch in the room next door. And making sure you have good sanitation for your tools, equipment, your workers are following good practices. Um, you know, all these indoor air quality problems that we have in normal buildings can even be exacerbated in these buildings that you're now retrofitting with improper HVAC um, and now you have mold on your walls, mold on your pipes, um, and that could contribute to these high TYM counts. Making sure that your machinery for trimming and hand trimming, uh, your tools are clean, and your drying process is really validated so that you know you're getting down to a certain water activity uh, consistently every time and you're testing that. That, I would argue, is the critical control point within cannabis is a proper dry cure. And even improper storage, I've seen this multiple times um, where I go into a facility and cannabis is stored in turkey bags that have a loose knot um, in a room that's not environmentally controlled that gets hot in summer and really cold in the winter. Um, that's just not really a, a good way to store cannabis. And so what we can get from the research that's being done on uh, cannabis and high bio burden levels or those high CFU per gram counts is we can really take that and again, take a quality by design approach to look through the entire process of cultivation and ask yourself as a manufacturer, where are these different risks coming in at each step of your process? Environmental microorganisms. If you have mold on your pipes, which I just saw at a cannabis facility earlier this week, um, are the, is that gonna be the same mold that you find on your final product? Is that gonna contribute to high TYM counts? Well, how do you test for that? What are you gonna put in place to control for that? Raw materials, I've seen cocoa, I've tested cocoa so many times and seen aspergillus, seen E. coli. Those raw materials are coming in from a supplier. How are they gonna control that risk? And how are you gonna control that risk? So you're not bringing in Trojan horses into your garden. Water quality is a big one, especially if you're recirking water or you have drip lines, um, making sure you're cleaning those drip lines. Um, you know, pathogens, normal parts of plant microbiome. So microbes live everywhere. They live on plants, they live on people. Not all of them are bad, but if those microbiomes are dysregulated and pathogens come in, that can lead to high TYM counts or other high bacterial counts. Again, good handling by your workers so you're not introducing microbes. You want to have a good dry cure and a good storage environment so you're not introducing or allowing spoilage microorganisms and be very careful with how you use beneficials. They can be very useful, but don't spray on flowering plants. And again, if we take this, you know, we can really take these preventive measures and start adapting them from other industries. So I really like this pathogen control equation that's from the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. Um, and it shows, you know, if you separate your raw materials from your ready to eat, you have good practices and controlled conditions, you have good sanitation and equipment design so you can clean that equipment, um, effective cleaning and sanitation, how are you verifying that you've cleaned, you, you know, just looking at something, you're not going to be able to see microbes there. So what are the validation and verification steps for that? And then monitoring, environmental monitoring is another big thing that cannabis uh, cultivators just don't really do or think about. And it's not that hard to get those programs up and running in your facility. And all of these together really end up with good, uh, effective pathogen control. 
And when looking at parallel culinary herbs instead of medicinal herbs like cannabis, um, these culinary herb recommendations from the Western Growers Association really says that cultivators should focus on preventing adulteration by microbial contamination to reduce or eliminate human pathogen levels on that product. And even, uh, even groups like Fedrican have come out with good cannabis cultivation practices that really focus again on contamination prevention, again, looking at, at these very common themes, cleaning, air filtration, personal hygiene, um, how is your product and waste flowing through your facility? That's something called hygienic zoning and food safety. Um, really looking at all of these elements here to prevent contamination proactively. And the European Medicine Agency and World Health Organization have come out with uh, recommendations for herbal medicinal products where they explicitly say, you know, microbial reduction treatments like ozone or radiation, which are used to remediate in cannabis, cannot replace good agricultural and collection practices or good manufacturing practices. And you can't use those treatments to disguise products that are contaminated or unfit for consumption. And when you do use those treatments, because those treatments can be used responsibly um, on product that is compliant and you know, meets all of the specifications before treatment, that those treated products must be labeled so consumers know that it has undergone some treatment. And then finally, the United States Pharmacopeia in their recommendations for cannabis flower products, they quote, uh, say that treatment methods such as irradiation should not be used as a means to remediate cannabis contaminated above the allowed limits. Now, unfortunately, this is not uh, how irradiation is used in the United States. Same with ozone, radio frequency. All of these remediation technologies are basically abused, again, to get that product passing. So it's taking adulterated product and treating it until it passes through this quality by testing scheme. And you know, a lot of these companies do, they try to promote it as being safe, as <clears throat> you know, uh, return on your investment. There's even little calculators where people can put in pounds of flour that have failed and how much they'll recover after they use this magic remediation technology. But really, it's all bad practice. And the, the real solution is to address this contamination at the root cause. So in summary, microbes and their biological agents do pose risks to cannabis smokers and to those who vaporize flour. And we're just starting to understand those risks. There's you know, a growing body of evidence um, showing that these risks are real, they do exist, but there's still so much more that we need to know. Uh, we need to research medical uh, professionals and scientists really, um, you know, they're inhibited by this, the federal uh, state the cannabis is in. It's, it's very challenging to really understand these risks when it's hard to get your hands on the product or really talk to people candidly about uh, their use of cannabis. This quality by testing scheme in each state does not require manufacturers to pro proactively address risks or even understand the root cause of their microbial contamination. As long as it passes, it can go to consumers. And remediation of contaminated product is really not a solution. Um, many people use it as a stopgap. They tell their, themselves it'll be a stopgap until they can figure out what's causing it, but they end up just relying on that remediation technology to get their products to pass. And this is important because remediation is not allowed in other consumed goods. If you had, you know, leafy greens that tested positive for E. coli or that were spoiled, you couldn't treat it with irradiation or ozone to recover it and then sell it to consumers. That's not allowed. Um, and it also violates World Health Organization, USP and EU Medicines Agency recommendations. So really the best answer is adopting some of these risk prevention measures from parallel industries and building in these quality by design principles, we're starting to understand where the root causes of these microbial contaminants are coming from. So starting to build that in until we can, until the industry as a whole develops good practices or the FDA comes in and says, now you have to adhere to, you know, um, leafy green standards for culinary herb uh, standards and, um, or something like that. Until that happens, 
we should be as an industry uh, leveling up and really bringing quality to the next uh, stage of our advancement as the industry grows. So with that, um, I'm just gonna end with my contact information. You can reach out to me if you have any questions um, through my company, Rogue Micro, or through the Aerobiology and Disinfection Laboratory uh, at CU Boulder, where we do a lot of experiments with these bio aerosols. You know, this is something that we're very um, excited about. And uh, we work with allergens and toxins and um, pathogens. So if you are interested in any type of collaboration, please do reach out. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Eden. <laughs> so we have several questions. Um, I'm going to start with one um, asking about sort of the state by state development, uh, as you mentioned earlier. But uh, there are various um, mechanisms to grow, whether that's indoor, uh, greenhouse, uh, outdoor, uh, as well as regional variations. Are there any sort of best practices that relate to sort of growth patterns or location? Yeah, so um, I've seen I've seen C of A's from folks in indoor and outdoor grows. Uh, both have extremely high uh, levels of TYM and aerobic bacteria. Um, it really depends, I think. I mean, your climate does play a big role. Uh, for example, Zamir Punja, that work that I uh, that I showed on a few slides before this last one. He grows in a greenhouse in Canada, and his TYM counts uh, were averaging around two to three thousand uh, TYM or you know, CFU per gram TYM, and that's pretty low. I mean, I grew in my backyard last year, and I tested in my in-house micro lab, which is in my kitchen, <laughs> and it only had fifteen hundred CFU on average. And so, you know, there are things you can do, even if you're in a greenhouse or if you're outdoors. You know, with outdoors, it's not as well understood, I think, um, but spacing is probably really important for those outdoor um, grows to make sure that you're allowing for good airflow. Um, outdoor, in my experience, tends to be a little bit higher on the micro side. But that being said, too, these greenhouses, it's not like they're incredibly environmentally controlled. There's not a lot of barriers between in and outside air. You can get really low bio burdens on that uh, greenhouse level. And then indoor can be just as high and maybe even higher with some of these known indoor um, molds like, you know, uh, aspergillus is one, but you think about like stacky uh, black mold, um, other things like that, they can pose real risks to people, especially workers that are in that building, you know, in these high humidity, warmer temperatures, you're basically just growing microbes in these indoor environments that weren't necessarily built for that. So yeah, I think those best practices, they've not really been established, but you can look to other CEA or controlled environment agriculture for pointers on um, good practices to establish a good HVAC. I shared not too long ago um, some resources on making sure your HVAC is actually, you know, working as intended and creating an environment that's not allowing microbes to thrive in those indoor ag situations. Outdoors, it's a little harder um, drier environments like Colorado, California, they tend to be a little bit more favorable for um, passing these tests because more humid environments, like when I worked in, in New York, upstate New York, it's a little bit more humid up there. Those micro levels tend to be a little bit higher. So it really does, um, it's not really well understood, but look to those good CEA practices if you want some guidelines. Thank you. Uh, how should patients respond to pharmacists or bud tenders who tell them that microbial remediation does not adversely impact their medicine? Yeah, so um, so this is something that I've actually struggled with here in Colorado as well. I'll go to dispensaries. I actually did a secret shopper about this time last year where I picked up about a dozen different cannabis flower products and I tested them at home and some of them did fail. And I asked bud tenders, do you, can you tell if this has been remediated? Can you look in metric, the system that, you know, really inventories these products? And they're like, no, we can't tell. We don't know. There's no way for us to tell. Some states you can, some states you can't. Um, remediation may 
definitely impact, you know, the oxidative state of terpenes, which could, you know, if, if that synergistic effect, um, that entourage effect is something that you feel is really impacting your the medicinal value of cannabis, then it could alter that terpene content. It could potentially alter the cannabinoid profiles. But really, um, in my mind, the risks are those microbial skeletons, you know, are all over that product. Just because you've got that product compliant, um, because it now passes that threshold of bio burden, does not mean that you've removed those risks. So maybe some of the acute risks of living microorganisms have been mitigated, but all the bioactive agents are still there. It does not erase away those microorganisms. Their skeletons and their agents are still all over that product and um, still pose a risk to consumers. And that's really where I would say the major risks are. Uh, there's a, a similar question, uh, but it's asking about sort of information that consumers should be aware of, but doesn't seem to be conveyed by any type of media. Uh, so it, any solutions to that, or have you seen any specific media focus on this issue? I haven't. I mean, usually when you see uh, like panel discussions on this topic, it's going to be from the remediation companies themselves, which I think is an incredible conflict of interest. Um, where, you know, they're you know, smack talking each other, but they're all doing the same thing. They're recovering adulterated product. And I've been screaming into the void about this for the last year or so, um, just because I have seen remediation technologies abused in the industry. And uh, it's not there. It's not being done to protect consumers. It's being done to invest to protect investors pocketbooks because they want to recover this product instead of actually address the root cause of these microbial contaminants. And that's really the, the issue is, um, you know, we focus on pesticides, which do have risks, and I don't want to undermine that. Um, we focus on, you know, the kind of qualitative aspects of what remediation can do, like we were talking about terpenes, maybe some therapeutic value, but we don't really address the risks that could be associated with these living organisms and their bioactive agents. And that's really why I'm glad that we can talk about this today and uh, start communicating this and drum up some conversation about it. Thank you. Uh, this question, uh, the speaker wants to make sure they got the information correctly, that vaping does not provide any decrease of E. coli in mm -hmm. aerosol, but do you know if smoking does decrease bacterial load in smoke? And also, do you think this difference would be observed for myotoxins uh, vaping wouldn't destroy it, but smoking would. So, um, you know, vaping does not get as hot as smoking. Um, you know, actually, a lot of people prefer vaping flour because it's a let. It's not as harsh to smoke. Um, it's it preserves some of that terpene profile for that sensory aspect. You can really smell and taste it a lot better when you're vaping. Um, but because it doesn't get as hot, you know, those pyrolysis that right re reaction. Uh, that combustion reaction doesn't happen at uh, as frequent of a, a rate. And so what that FDA study showed is basically there was no difference before and after vaporization um, with E. coli. And E. coli is a pretty vulnerable microbe. You know, we're not talking about a spore former or spores from, from fungi, which are really, really resistant to heat and other types of environmental challenges. We're talking about E. coli, which is kind of the pansy of microbes, right? So it um, it really showed no difference. There's not been a lot of uh, studies done, as far as I know, on cannabis combustion, tobacco combustion a little bit more, and they have shown that those bioactive agents like LPS or gosterol, not much has been done on toxins. Um, but if those components can carry over, it just is, you know, logical to assume that uh, some of these other bioactive agents can carry over. And when you also think about it, when you combust, th when you combust uh, cannabis, THCA gets converted to THC, but that doesn't get broken down completely into its other molecular components. And so it's preserved as well. That's why you get high. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these components are likely not going to be completely broken down um, during combustion either. Um, do you have any recommendations for approaches to viable microbe and endotoxin sampling in aerolyzed e-juice? 
impactors versus impingers versus membrane ah. filters? Ooh, this is definitely a cool like aerobiology question. I'm so glad I'm in Mark's lab. Um, so in our lab, we use something uh, called biospots. They're made from aerosol devices up in um, just northern Colorado, I think in Loveland or uh, Fort Collins. And it is called condensation capture. So basically their air flows over this wick that has different temperatures and humidities along the uh, sections of that wick. And very, very small particles will basically get coated in moisture and water droplets and it will rain down and be collected. And so it's a very gentle way of collecting um, you know, these living microorganisms and, you know, allergens is what I really focus on. So that's like the most gentle way, but there are, you know, impact-based uh, ways to look at, there are cheaper ways, like you can put out settle plates in your facility, which are basically just open Petri dishes, you know, different auger media, depending on what you want to use. Um, and that can be good. It's, it's, it's a very low cost, low, um, technical proficiency way to start getting eyes on the microbes in your facility. Uh, the problem with that is that really tiny spores like aspergillus spores, which are only like two microns in diameter, they don't settle very well. It takes them a very long time to come out of the air and fall on those plates. So if you have any airflow, they, you won't, you might not see them. So that's where those active samplers can be better where, um, you can basically like hook a Petri dish up to a vacuum or there's other like cyclone based uh, or filter based, all of them I think can be useful. Uh, they're better than nothing. So start where you can, as far as where your finances are. And once you get a better idea of the aerobiome in your facility, um, you can advance your te techniques and technologies to kind of meet the needs that you have. Uh, we're approaching the hour. I'm going to get one more question in uh, and then ask if it would be all right if they contact you directly with any additional questions. Sure. So an ongoing concern is contamination that occurs in product that pass testing initially. Uh, is there a standardized process used in other similar industries that can control this? Mm, that's a great question. So uh, when you look at like other herbal products or spices, that's another kind of parallel you can draw from. Basically, you want to store cannabis in a cool, dry environment. So USP does have some recommendations for what cool, dry environment means. You really want it to be 50% humidity or lower and below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So a nice, cool, dry place for uh, storage of your final product. Um, I would even put in hygrometers into those final storage bins to make sure that you aren't accidentally spiking in humidity uh, in those storage containers because you know you you might dry and bring everything down to a moisture content or water activity that you think is good. But as everyone knows, those things can fluctuate if you don't allow proper curing. And most people, you know, most cultivators want to get product out the door. And so they don't always cure for the time to really normalize that uh, water activity. And so just keeping an eye on that, putting some tools in place so that you can monitor that. Most microbes won't be able to grow um, if your water activity is about 0.6 plus or minus 0.05. So that's like about 60% relative humidity if it's at equilibrium with the environment around it. So that's where those little $5 hygrometers can really come uh, in real handy. So that's, and good storage is, um, is something that also a lot of cultivators don't have room for. You know, they'll kind of store things wherever they have room and in the office and in the hallway, you know, so making sure that you've gone through all this hard work to grow and cultivate and dry and cure this beautiful product, it's past testing, don't drop the ball during final storage. Make sure that you dedicate space and resources for that. Thank you, Dr. Edom. Uh, we have had loads of questions to your presentation <laughs> that we weren't able to get to. Uh, so we posted your email address and uh, I'd urge uh, sort of the participants to contact you directly with questions. Uh, but we really want to thank you for your presentation, uh, the importance of the issue, uh, and sort of bringing it forward for discussion about both patients and consumers. So thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much. It's been really nice to hang out with all y'all. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.